Okay, so this is going to be uh, a course on um, on virtual knot theory, but uh, we're going to, as soon as we can, uh, go into Kovana homology and related matters. So what I plan to do today is to review, uh, to give an elementary lecture reviewing what is virtual knot theory, um, and then uh, talk about the Jones polynomial a bit. And maybe if we have enough time today, we'll begin talking about Kovana homology. So, so the title of the course is Virtual Knots and Kovana homology. Okay, so so first of all, we want to talk about virtual knot theory. And I know that most of you already know about this, but let's just start at the beginning so we can record some conventions and things. Um, so uh, one way to say this uh, is that we are going to take uh, uh, classical knot theory classical diagrammatic knot theory and extend it with a new crossing. called the virtual crossing. And on that, we can then have diagrams that look like this, where some of the crossings are virtual. Now, of course, you can extend classical knot theory to add extra kinds of crossings in other ways as well, and maybe we should discuss that, such as graphical uh, crossings or rigid vertex crossings, various other kinds of crossings. But this particular kind of crossing has its own rules, and uh, I want to say what they are immediately, and then we'll interpret this in different ways. So, um, with the help of these sorts of diagrams, and maybe the period is confusing, with the help of this kind of diagram, we can have Reitermeister moves and we can have detour moves. And the most concise way of saying what the extension is, is that, yes, we'll have the Reitermeister moves. So they look like this. And we'll have the detour moves, and they look like this. Here's a blob with some lines coming out of it. And here's a line going through some of the lines coming out of the blob, and they're all virtual. Then, then you are allowed to take that consecutive collection of virtual crossings and move it somewhere else, maintaining the virtuality of the crossings that you made. So 
you can take a consecutive sequence of virtual crossings and cut them out and reconnect them somewhere else. And the, those are the detour moves. And that's the way we are, we're extending classical knot theory. So in particular, that would mean uh, that this guy here, for example, would be equivalent to somebody else where I start from here and end here and go through whatever I do virtually. I'm removing it from here to here and I can put it somewhere else. So for example, I could put it back around here if I wanted to. And then these would have to be virtual. So these two diagrams are equivalent diagrams like that. Okay. Um, now, it's convenient, in fact, to um, write down some very small moves that generate all the detour moves, and let's talk about that in a moment. And it's also convenient to have a better interpretation than purely diagrammatic for all of this. So, small moves that generate detour moves. Well, you could do this. And that's going across this, but uh, you could just as well cut that out and have it go directly over, you see. Well, let me just do it. Um, I'll write the move, um, which is this. But think about it as a detour. Um, you started here, and you went from here to here. So that will be equivalent via detour move to cutting that out, leaving that, leaving that. And then you can connect these two any way you like. So you could connect it like that if you wanted to. And then this is equivalent to just this because we allow it's part, part of Rademeister moves. that we allow planar isotopy. Sure. So you see, uh, this is actually a detour move. Um, and another example, which is obviously a detour move, is this one, where I We'll just pull it apart like a Rademeister 2 move. But you see, this is the same as cutting this out and then detouring it this way. Um, and uh, you could have a triple like that. And then this will be equivalent to that. And those are pure, so far pure, uh, purely virtual uh, small moves, but then there is this, where there's a crossing of a classical kind, and then there are a couple of virtual crossings going on above it, like that, and this is equivalent to cutting that out and redrawing it below. So you were allowed to do that, cut it out and redraw it below, and there you are. So you see, um, that's also a detour move. And then, um, if you had a more complicated detour move, let's just make something up for the sake of, of illustration. Um, maybe you had something like this. Well, uh, by, by pure detour, you could 
you could take this point and this point and you could say I will cut that out and I will I will take it all the way down to the bottom here and back up um, but you see you can also you can also do this little bit by little bit um, taking this across this crossing that would be using this number three prime here three prime for third modified Reitermeister right move um, and here is a, a three or call that three double prime and call this one three prime and this one two prime and this one one prime uh, the sort of Reitermeister right moves for virtual crossings so anyway by a by a um, three double prime uh, you could get this down to here and then if you look at what you have there you can get it further by doing it across this one and across that one and I leave it for you as an exercise it's not hard to see that you can factorize any detour move into a composition of small moves. And why would we worry about small moves? Well, one, one reason to think about the small moves is because it might be that that's all you really wanted to do or you wanted to check that something was invariant. Or you might be interested in virtual braids. And as long as we're talking about virtual knot theory uh, at its beginnings, let's talk for a few minutes about virtual braids because I think I didn't mention them at all in the previous course, hardly at all. Um, but... Um, I don't want to talk about them instantly. Uh, what I want to do is talk about uh, some of the interpretations here and also about how to make an invariant or two. So we have the theory described this way combinatorially. Let's go for an invariant now, right now. A couple of invariants. So, so I want to show you a way to get some invariants, uh, and I'm going to begin with this example. And I'm going to label its crossings and orient it. And then I can talk about the Gauss code. Now, this is not an invariant. This is just another way of representing the structure, but it is related to getting an invariant. Um, so I want to talk about the Gauss code. And uh, what I mean by the Gauss code is that I should walk along the knot, starting somewhere, and explain the structure of the crossings as I meet them. So I'm describing, and my description is over crossing number one, and it's plus. That is to say, I call a crossing of classical type plus, if it looks like that, right hand rule, fingers of your right hand pointing, thumb points in the same direction as the under crossing line. And this one I call minus, right hand rule again, fingers of your right hand pointing along the overcrossing line, your thumb is pointing oppositely to the undercrossing line, minus. That's the convention of plus and minus. So this is over one plus, then it goes under two plus still, and that's all there is. You come back through the virtual crossing, but you don't say. So this all by itself actually is determining this diagram. Um, the diagram doesn't exist in the plane without this kind of cross cut. So you see how you could try reconstructing. You would say, all right, I have an over one plus, so the one must look like this. 
it's plus. And I also have an under two plus, so I have a crossing number two in plus form, it looks like this. Um, and then over one, under two, and you see there's only one thing in this case that I can do. And then um, um, oh, I, I'm sorry, over one, under two, and then I didn't finish my code. Um, uh, under one and over two. They're all plus. So there's a lot of redundancy in writing plus that way, but I take a walk all the way around the diagram describing as I go until I come back to where I started. And that's the Gauss code. We'll talk about something else related to the Gauss code in a moment. But now let's go through the reconstruction. Over one, under two, under one, and over two. And now you see I'm landlocked. I can't draw this in the plane unless I use a virtual crossing, but I decide to use a virtual crossing and come back. And you see, this is the same as what we had before, almost in fact, literally the same in this case, but it might have come out a little different depending on how I had set things up. Try an example of your own. But the Gauss code has no virtual crossings. So we can write down lots of Gauss codes uh, with pluses and minuses and pairs of symbols, right? Um, and they may not be realizable in the plane without virtual crossings. So another way of thinking about it is that the virtual knot theory, for knots at least, is equal to Gauss codes for the knots. Um, modulo Reitermeister moves on the Gauss codes. And we don't have to worry about doing anything like detours because there aren't any. The Gauss code only knows about what to do on the code itself. Of course, you have to explain how to do Reitermeister moves on the codes. And that can be done by watching how you do Reitermeister moves on the diagrams and translating it into the codes. Let me leave that be for the time being, but we can say that the virtual knot theory is all Gauss codes modulo Reitermeister moves. The classical knot theory is certain special Gauss codes which embed in the plane. And then you see that the Gauss codes as a whole are like all graphs as opposed to planar graphs. And, um, and the analogy is that virtual knot theory is to classical knot theory, the analogy. is that virtual knot theory is to classical knot theory as um, all graphs is to planar graphs. So you can think of the classical knots as the planar knots and the virtual knots are non-planar. And in fact, we will take that analogy seriously and ask, well, if they're not planar, then where do they fit? We'll see in a moment. Um, there's another thing about the Gauss code, and that is that along with the Gauss code, there is the Gauss diagram. And this is a useful device, the Gauss diagram. The Gauss diagram consists in a, a nice circle like this, and then you have the crossings, like in this case, one and two. And we had over one, oh, and there will be a, a repeat, one, two, one, two. In this case, that's the bare code. It goes one, two, one, two. And then I want to indicate overs and unders and pluses and minuses. So one is over as it comes along, starting here, means will be indicated by putting an arrow outward. 
and two is under will be indicated by putting an arrow inward. And now if you read along, it says over one, under two, under one, over two. And then the signs are placed on the chords. So these are the chords, and this is the chord diagram, and maybe I orient the chord diagram as well. And, uh, and a diagram of this course uh, this is a uh, is a planar with crossings representation of the same information as this linear string here, but it's useful actually to have it have the Gauss diagram and to think about Gauss diagrams as a kind of an alternative diagram to the knot diagram, and there is information. For example, here the chords intersect, and the chords intersect has to do with the fact as you see, um, uh, that, that the appearances of one are intersticing with the appearances of two, like that. And so if you started decorating the code, you would find you had drawn the chord diagram and vice versa. Um, so uh, so it's, a, it's nice to understand that we have the chord diagrams and the Gauss codes and the Gauss diagrams uh, available to us for thinking about these matters. Now, um, if you take the bare Gauss code, that contains some small information which turns out to be very useful. The bare Gauss code is obtained by letting go of all the decorations. So then you just have one, two, one, two in this case. And you will notice that in this case, we have that one has an odd number of things in between it, and two also has an odd number of things in between it. I say that one and two are odd crossings. Their Gaussian parity is odd. And odd and even is discriminated by whether or not there are an odd or an even number of occurrences of other symbols in between the reoccurrence of a given symbol. And as you see, it means, if you think about it a little bit, that the chords corresponding to them will intersect in an odd number of points. Now I'm going to make some use of that. So here's our knot again. And the, the bare Gauss code is 1, 2, 1, 2. And both crossings are odd. Now I'm going to make a definition in general. Um, the odd rive. of k, which for some reason I have called j of k, um, is defined as follows. j of k is equal to the sum over c belonging to the odd crossings of k of the sine of the crossing, where I remember that the sine of this is plus one, and the sine of this is minus one. Um, so I, I take the sum only over odd crossings of the signs, 
You may be familiar with the ride of a classical knot, which is just the sum of all the signs. But the claim here is that J of K is a virtual knot theory invariant. Meaning that it's invariant under the Reitermeister moves and on and invariant under Detour moves. So we need to understand what will happen to it under Reitermeister moves, basically. Um, as far as Detour moves are concerned, nothing happens there, right? You imagine a diagram and like this one, and suppose that I picked up this diagrams uh, and changed the Detour structure. Doesn't change the bare Gauss code at all, and it doesn't change the crossing relations, it doesn't change whether they're even or odd. No, so the detour move doesn't do anything to this, it's just a question of the Reitermeister move. So we have to look carefully at each Reitermeister move. So we look at the first Reitermeister move, and let's call this crossing I, and then in a, in a Gauss code that would be going along and then you would have I, and then you would have I, and then you would be going along, right? And so this is even, right? The number of things in between I and the reoccurrence of I is zero, which is even. So there's no problem there. We never even use it. Type two move. Now we have this. And I will orient it this way for the sake of our argument here. But you will notice that uh, this one has a plus sign and this one has a minus sign. And let's call this crossing I and this crossing J. And uh, then let's think about a Gauss code which starts here. And then it runs along and goes through IJ. And then after a while it goes through IJ again. So the Gauss code looks like this, I, then immediately J, then alpha for some string of letters going along and along and along, and finally I and J again, and then beta, uh, and you would be back where you started. Uh, so maybe I will, uh, I will just put a little wiggly line just focusing on this bit of the Gauss code. I, J, some string of symbols, I and J. So now, um, what I claim is that I and J are both odd or both even. Well, let's see. What symbols lie between I and I? One plus the number of symbols in alpha. And what symbols lie between J and J? The same. This equals uh, the num... Um, well, I won't write it. Let's just leave the board and look at it. Between... Uh, J and J, it's the same, one, one occurrence of I, and alpha again. So one plus uh, absolute alpha, one plus the number of symbols in alpha, is the number of symbols between I and I, and also equal to the number of symbols between J and J. So they stand together or fall together. They're both odd or they're both even. Now, if they're both even, then they don't get counted in the sum. And if they're both odd, then they both get counted. But if both get counted, then we have plus one plus minus one equals zero. That is in calculating our arrive, we would add one for this and minus one for that, and it comes to adding nothing. So it will have exactly the same effect 
as if we had pulled it apart. And so we have that it's invariant under the second Rademacher move. And I will leave it as an exercise. to check invariance of this under the third Reitermeister move. And you'll find it's true that it's invariant under the third Reitermeister move as well. And so therefore, it is an invariant of virtual knots. And let's see what we can do with it. Well, we'll go back to the example that we have been looking at. And we have that J of K is equal to 2. But what do we know about this J of K? All right? So J of K is an invariant of virtual knots. Um, uh, J of K classical is equal to zero because classical not diagrams do not have any odd crossings. Look at an example. Here's the trefoil knot. And the code one, two, remember I only need the bare code. One, two, three, one, two, three. <laughs> it would be good if I could synchronize my speech and my actions. All right. One, two, three. One, two, three. And indeed, an even number between 1 and 1, an even number between 2 and 2, and an even number between 3 and 3. Um, of course you say, oh, how, why is that? How do I know that? Well, here's the proof. Imagine you're in a big diagram. It could be some huge mess of a diagram. And... You decide to investigate what happens when you uh, examine the trip from a given crossing, I, and you wander around in the diagram for a while, and eventually you come back to I here, right? And in this case, there weren't any self-crossings on that loop, but there might have been. Um, and then you see that there are a lot of other uh, bits and pieces of diagram that are wandering through uh, the, the trip you took. Mm -hmm. Like that. And for every entrance there's an exit. You have uh, lines, other lines from the diagram other than this loop that you drew, and every one of them intersects this loop in an even number of points by the Jordan curve theorem. And there are no virtual crossings, so no oddity can occur. But if there were virtual crossings, oddity could occur. The number of symbols that you meet as you go from I to I in the Gauss code is the number of intersection points that you meet as you walk along here. And there are, as you see, an even number because they're paired up, each arc going through and coming back out, or it might go back and forth a number of times. 
And of course, it's quite possible that we should think about the more general case where the trip from here to there involved some self-crossings before it came back. That would be all right, because each self-crossing happens twice. Once the first time you go through and once the second time you go through. So they're all contributing an even number of times, or not at all if they were virtual, but we're not talking about virtuals. And then there will be other arcs from the diagram that wander in and out, and they might wander in and out, of course. They might. But nevertheless, you can argue from the Jordan curve theorem that the number of intersections that you obtain here will be even. And therefore, in the classical case, there aren't any odd crossings. No odd crossings. And therefore, um, the um, invariant will be zero on classical knots. So that's good. That means that if we have two, that implies that K is non-trivial and non-classical. And what I mean by non-classical is serious. I mean, you could have a virtual knot that really was classical. After all, you could. Um, for example, we could take the trefoil knot, and then we could decide that we would put some virtual crossings in there and then come back to where we started and make a diagram like this. And and then I could try to sell you this as a genuine virtual knot, and maybe you would pay me good money for it. But it isn't a genuine virtual knot. It's just a classical one, uh, because there's a, a very simple detour move on this diagram, which takes you right back to the trefoil. Right. Uh, something like that. Right. So, um, so if you found yourself with a, uh, a classical knot diagram, uh, it might look virtual. And so if we find ourselves with a diagram which has a non-zero J, a non-zero odd rise, then it cannot possibly be isotoped over to a classical knot. can't be done because it would be zero under those circumstances. And that's... Uh, not the only property, but it's the only property I have room for on this slide, unless I get rid of something. Let's just put another property over here. And that property is a good one. It is that J of the mirror image of a knot is the negative of J of the knot. Or the mirror image is reverse all crossings in J. In K. So the mirror image of this means you switch this crossing and you switch that crossing and you obtain the mirror image. Of course, the switch of a virtual crossing is the same, virtual crossing. And we have that J of K star is minus 2. So whenever you have somebody with non-zero odd ride, uh, why, um, it's distinct from its mirror image. So this means we easily understand many, many virtual knots uh, are in equivalent to their mirror images with this very simple invariant. And the property of parity um, is quite particular to virtual knots. Any questions about this invariant? It's a nice one, and you should try it out on some examples. Of course, it won't always, it won't always prove things for you. Uh, let's see uh, an example where it doesn't quite do very much.
I think this example is going to force us a little later on to recall a few other invariants from our previous discussion. But for right now, just look at it. Here it is. Um, and um, what's its Gauss code? Three crossings. And the bare Gauss code is one, two, three, one, two, three. So all crossings are are even. Let's call this one k. And j of k is equal to 0. So j of k doesn't give us any information about this knot. And in fact, this knot has a way of the law of avoiding giving too much information to various invariants, um, but we will be able to pinpoint it. It's, it is non-trivial, non-classical. Um, what else can I tell you about this example? Mm, not too much more, but I think you ought to look at its regular Gauss code because it's interesting to see what happened here. So let's write that down, starting here. This is a plus crossing. This is a plus crossing. Ah, but this is a minus crossing. So it isn't quite a trefoil diagram, you see? In the trefoil, it would be plus, 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 but this one is minus. So its code is over 1 plus, under 2 plus, over 3 minus under 1 plus, over 2 plus, and under 3 minus. And it differs from the trefoil in that the crossing sign got switched when we did this. So, so that's what we did. We switched the sign on the crossing. And this code went from being realizable in the plane to being not realizable in the plane. This, this actually leads to some interesting ideas. Uh, you might take a look at it just for the sake of trying some examples of your own. There's a, there's a 1 plus. There's a 2 plus. And there's a 3 minus. And now you follow the instructions of the code, trying to reconstruct from the Gauss code. Over 1, under 2, over 3, under 1, over 2, under 3. Oh. You see my problem. I've gone and enclosed myself in a circuit, and the only way I get to go under three is like that, and then under three, and then um, did I forget to go back to one? One, two, three, one, two, three, but I have to go back to where I started, under three, and so I end up having to go back here. Um, and I need another one. So it's possible to have a non-planar Gauss code obtained from a perfectly good planar Gauss code by changing the orientation signs. Okay, so I want to mention one more thing about parity. And in the, in, in the course of that, to tell you about uh, another variant, which I think we will use, there's a variant of knot theory called knotoids. Which was defined and named by Vladimir Turayev. And a knotoid 
is a gadget like this. It's no virtual crossings, but it's a knot with endpoints. A knot diagram with endpoints. And the endpoints can be in different regions, just as I have drawn here. Okay? So you could have um, the initial point and the final point, if you like. Um, and otherwise, Reitermeister moves and do not allow sliding anything past an endpoint. So this is a very, very natural uh, generalization of classical knot theory, right? In classical knot theory, we already were thinking about 1-1 one, one tangles. This is a, a knot type knotoid or a 1-1 one, one tangle. A 1-1 one, one tangle is a bit of knot diagram that's allowed to move around in between these two points, not allowed to move over the end points, and the two points are in the same region. Um, so this is called a knot type knotoid. Now I bring up knotoids because it's useful to go back and forth between knotoids and some things about virtual knots and also some things about classical knots. And knotoids also have parity. I think you saw that immediately. Uh, we don't really need to name these input and output uh, points right now, so let's just leave them unnamed. But let's name the crossings and look at the Gauss code of this guy, orienting him from one end to the other. Um, and you see that the Gauss code is 1, 2, 1, 2. And it has odd crossings. So, we can define J of K same way. So parity also exists for the nautoids. And the nautoids are a little closer to being just classical. They're little bits of tangles which, whose endpoints you're keeping track of. And they can have parity. So if you're looking to see how parity might interact with classical things, then this is one of the ways in which it can. So I mentioned nautoids. Now, Let me talk about a way <coughs> to interpret the virtual knot theory. Okay. Um, was there a question? Yeah, also, um, when we are applying those nodes in the hearts, won't we get a scalar? Mm. I'm having a little trouble uh, <laughs> hearing you. Am I audible now? Uh, well, give it a try, otherwise I may ask you to write in the chat line. Uh, okay, maybe I can write it in the chat box. You want to write in the chat line? Mm -hmm. I'll stop the share for a moment so I can see. Oh, uh, I can't that? stop. Yeah, I can. Um, I just needed to get to the chat line. That's, does parity exist in the case of singular knots? Singular classical knots? Do you mean singular classical knots? Oh, that Neha Nando, that wasn't your 
question. This is Ibrahim. Um, uh, Neha, would you write your question also? Yes, sir, I'm writing. Mm -hmm. If we apply moves in nautoids, then wouldn't we get a straight loop always? Uh, no, no, I'll explain why not in a moment, all right? But as for parity and singular knots, yes. Uh, so let's go back to my scrawl board and see, okay? So first of all, uh, let me talk about the question of, um, of whether a nautoid would just end up being trivial. So let's look at the nautoid that we just drew. Um, now, I, I want to appeal to your intuition first, but then I can also say, I can also say, um, I can also say for this nautoid oriented that way, that J of K is two, just like before. And all the arguments I made apply to it. And so you won't be able to simplify this. The simplest nautoid, K per U here, little u, um, j of little u is zero, okay? But but intuitively, uh, why, why can't you undo this? Well, because you're not allowed to push things across the ends, that's why. If you could, if you could take this arc and slide it back that way, then you could undo it, but you're not allowed to do that. So all you can do is, is move it around in typical Reitermeister move fashion in here. So for example, you might, um, you might, you might do that. It's equivalent to that, but that isn't helping you undo it, is it? So, so what I'm saying is that the main reason why you cannot undo these nautoids is because we forbade uh, moving anything across an endpoint. Does that help? Yes, so and here we we have it. So K is non-trivial. And K is not equivalent to K star. In fact, the same arguments that we made for virtuals apply to the nautoid. Uh, then Ibrahim asked about singulars. Now um uh, let, let's consider a singular for a moment. Oh, I wanted a crossing. So a favorite singular could be uh, this classical singular knot here, where whereas you see I have I have some crossings and some singular crossings. And, and then, then the question of parity uh, has to do with um, how you're going to think about the code. Um, if you want to think about the code for the singular as being just one, two, and we're ignoring the singular crossing, then you would have an odd parity code. If you're going to think of coding the singular very carefully by having the singular crossing as well, uh, then the code would look like one, two, singular, one, two, and then there are an even number of things in between. So, so it's a question of how you would want to think about it and how you would want to use it. So we could come back to that uh, question. Uh, I don't want to do it now because in order to ask about how I might use parity for singulars, I have to explain to you what the rules are for handling the singular crossings. And we can bring that up another time. Other questions? Okay, then let's go on. Ah, look, there is uh, one more question in the chat line. Okay. 
Now I should be able to get to that. Oh, there it is. I I see. Maybe. No. There. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Um. Oh. There's a. a oh. More. And chat. There we go. Okay. Nautoid can be interpreted as theta curve. What corresponds to virtual nautoid in this line? Okay, good question. Let me try talking to that question. Oops. Huh. I'm sorry. I made some mistake here. I hit something I didn't mean to hit. Oh, there we go. That'll make that disappear. No, it didn't make it disappear. Hmm. It has something to do with the chat. I don't know if you can even see it, but it's uh, it's, it's obscuring my my um, screen, and I'm just trying to get it move it out of the way, and probably I can just ignore it then. Uh, let's see. Yeah. All right. Looks like I'm okay. Um, oh, all right. Now I, I kind of forgot what I was. What was the question? Uh, notoid, uh, notoid can be interpreted as a theta curve. What corresponds to virtual notoid in this line? Oh yes, all right. So, in order in order to speak to that, I have to tell you about this nice way of encoding the notoid as a three dimensional object. The notoid can be thought of as a three dimensional object, uh, and the way to do that is as follows. You add to the nautoid an upper arc like that and a lower arc like this. I need to fix my upper arc so you see its relative relationship. So we could call this theta of k where k is this nautoid. Nautoid is a planar diagram, and you take it to theta of k, which is uh, a graph embedded in R3. And Taraev observes that theta of k classifies k, All right? So the, the, the embedding type with the topological vertices here of this graph in three-dimensional space encodes all the information that's in the notoid. This is another way of answering your question of why shouldn't they undo? You see, it's sort of more intuitively clear that you can't undo that. Um, but that's a nice theorem of Turayev that, uh, that the nautoid is given by an embedding of a theta graph in three-dimensional space. Uh, now, we do have virtual nautoids. For example, I could um, I could have uh, this guy, the simple one of the simpler things that are both uh, virtual and so on. And I can have a virtual notoid, and you could wonder whether there is a similar realization theorem, but I do not know. 
I do not know at this time. A generalization of the theta of G. So that's a good question. Um, uh, I just don't quite know what that is going to look like. And I think you'll appreciate how what the question would be if we start to talk about how to make a three-dimensional interpretation of virtuals to begin with, all right? Uh, we can make them more three-dimensional so that the crossing is not just an imaginary crossing which gets to move around the way I've told it to you so far. So, so let's keep this question in mind. I think it's a nice question. Maybe we can find an answer to it. So, so here is a way to turn the virtuals into more, ge more geometric, three-dimensional topological geometric entities. What I'm going to do is I'm go I'll, I'll show you more than one way to do this, but this is one of the simpler ways to think about this. I'm going to replace the virtual crossing by adding a a one handle to the plane. So the plane now became a torus at this point. And then one of these arcs goes up around the toral tube and the other goes underneath it like that. Okay. And then the virtual knot over here goes to a knot embedded in a surface across the unit interval, or a knot diagram in a surface. So for example, when we had this, we could say, all right, that means I'm going to take a handle I'm going to cut two discs out of the plane and put a tube between them. So now I have my detour for this. And then out here, I have this. And then this is going to run through the handle. And, and this is doing this job here. And then as this, as this one comes through... Let's see, this went through the handle this way and this is going underneath the handle. And this comes back here and that goes around over there. All right. And now this is, here's, here's what we call K and here's D of K. And this is a diagram on a torus. Well, if you think of K as a diagram on a two-sphere, think of it as a diagram on a two-sphere. We've drawn it in the plane, but then I'll stay with compact surfaces. And every time I have a virtual crossing, I add a handle, and, and then I get a diagram that is living on a surface. And this is a way to remove yourself from the non-planarity. The non-planarity of the virtual not is reflected in the fact that it may actually live in a non-trivial way on a higher genus surface. So we can ask ourselves, well, if I, if I think of this as a mapping, D taking virtual knot, knots over to diagrams on surfaces, uh, then, then you have to ask, well, what, what happens there uh, when you do these virtual moves? You're going to be changing the handle structure. Um, so let's think about that a little bit.
for example, you might have this. And, and so that means that you would have a handle. And you would have another handle. And you would be running along. And then there would be this other curve that went under this handle and then it went back under that handle. And out there on the surface, it isn't at all obvious. In fact, it's not true that you would be able to pull these apart, right? But we want to be able to pull these apart. And another thing about putting knots on surfaces is that um, you might have um, you might have a knot on a surface and a handle over here, but you'd have a knot over here, and it didn't have anything to do with that handle, right? I'm drawing that as though it were a plane with a handle on it, or you could imagine that you had a torus, and then on the torus there was a little knot diagram, and that little knot diagram doesn't really know about the extra handle structure here. This this knot diagram would be perfectly happy living on a two-dimensional sphere. So for these reasons, we we take the surfaces containing the diagrams up to handle stabilization. And by handle stabilization, I mean, well, first of all, if there was a handle over here that had absolutely nothing to do with the knot, um, you could remove it if there's nothing going through it and so on. Um, if, uh, uh, but, but there's actually a little more to that. Let me show you an example of what I mean. Suppose you had a curve that's going up through this handle. Then I can, now, if you have a handle, this handle looks awfully flat. I'm going to um, fix him up a little bit so he looks more uh, three-dimensional in my picture, if you pardon me. Uh, okay. Um, there. There. It's a little better. Now, um, If you have a handle like this, you can get rid of a handle by drawing a little meridional curve like that and cut. Right? And then you would have something like this. And something like that. And you would cut and you would add disks. The exact inverse of creating a handle. When you create a handle, you cut out two disks and you put in a tube. When you destroy a handle, um, you, you cut along uh, a non-trivial curve, open it up, and add the disks back, like that. And then, as you see, this is equivalent to just an old plane, bit of plane. The handle disappeared, right? So we can get to a handle to disappear like that. But that isn't the only way I could get this handle to disappear. I could also get this handle to disappear. Let me draw it down here. By drawing this curve. I'm cutting along that curve and adding the disks. And that will do the same job 
exactly the same job. It's the same as saying if we had a torus, we could cut along a meridian and put two discs in and get it to go away, or we could cut along a longitude and put two discs in and get it to go away. If you cut along the longitude, you see an annulus just as well as you do when you cut along a meridian. So, in particular, if I'm looking at this and there isn't anybody going underneath him, then I can take this curve here and cut along it. And this will then be equivalent to a plane with a little line going through it. So I hope that's clear to you that when I, so I handle stabilization means adding or subtracting handles. by using surgery curves outside the knot. So you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to change the genus of the surface that way. And you can look for the least genus surface that you can make in that form. Now with that in mind, let's go back to this little problem that we saw with the second Reitermeister move. Only I hope to show it to you in a, in a slightly easier way to think about. Here's a nice handle. Here's another one. Here's some bit of virtual knot going up along that way. And here's some going underneath. So neither of these handles can be immediately removed. This corresponds to that. Under my diagram mapping. Okay. But now, this is homeomorphic to the following. Is that clear? Um, what I did was I I thought to myself, well, I, I think I, I like this little disc here that goes right around the base of those two handles. Let's lift it upward. And as I lifted it upward, uh, I created a tube. This dotted line then became the base of this tube here. And the rest of this is up there. And you see that we have this extra tube, which starts here and ends up up here, right? So if I have two consecutive handles, I can take it up to homeomorphism like this, but then this is a removable. Right? This is removable. I can just cut the tube out and put discs in here and here. And after removing it, I end up with a long handle, which goes from one end to the other like that. Um, and, and this line, which goes 
all the way over there and two lines going underneath like that. So now I'm in a position to do a detour move when I wouldn't have been before. The two become one, which is just this long handle which goes all the way over from here to there. And then in the surface I can push that around as much as I like and then put it back down by adding tubes like that. So by adding and subtracting tubes, I'm changing the genus as I go, but I can take a consecutive sequence of virtual crossings and turn it into one single handle. Then that handle moves around to where I want to drop it again, and I drop it, and I get the other, uh, the other end of the detour move. So you see that the detour moves are actually available up there in the surface level if you allow uh, the addition and subtraction of empty handles. So in that way, we have the beginning of uh, the relationship between virtual knots and knots in surfaces. There's more to say about this, but, that, but that's a hint about That's a hint about how this mapping works. So we have this mapping from virtual knots to, um, we might call it surface knots, knot diagrams in surfaces modulo handle stabilization. Or you can start with a knot diagram in a surface and then wonder what kind of virtual knot would be related to it. See, you have that field to explore. So for example, I might start with this knot here. And there's a knot diagram in a surface. And I claim, I claim that this corresponds to and indeed in this case, if you were to add the handle exactly as I indicated to you and then play with it, you would see that it was equivalent to this. But there is actually more to say about, uh, about this relationship between putting knots in surfaces and the virtual knots. I gave you a very specific way to take a virtual knot to a knot in the surface by putting a handle in at every virtual crossing. But there is another and better way, and um, we're 10 minutes from the end. And I think I might as well tell you about that way as a way to finish today's talk. And we'll continue with more invariants and, and begin uh, things related to Kovanov on the next round. So, so let me say a little more about getting knots on surfaces. Um, in, in another way. Now, in terms of, of uh, the question about nautoids and the theta, um, if you have a virtual nautoid, you can also represent it on a surface, you see. But then when it's represented in a thickened surface, that isn't the same as putting it into three space. That's actually restricting it to the surface cross I. And that's why I say, I'm not quite sure how we might generalize the theta graph theorem. So we can come back to that too. But let me show you another way to get at diagrams and surfaces. So let's take that torus that we were looking at in the last slide.
which is now meant to be thought of as just some knot diagram that's drawn in some orientable surface. And someone is interested in the knot theory of it in that surface. But I want to get um, a bit of surface with boundary that's kind of canonical with respect to that diagram. So what I do is I take each crossing in the diagram and I form a little neighborhood that hugs it like this. So you see what that is, that's a bit of surface on which the crossing is drawn and it could be connected up to other bits of surface elsewhere. And for every crossing, I do that. And if I don't have a crossing, then I just make a little ribbon neighborhood. So, so you see what that is going to create here. It's going to create this. There's a bit of surface for the part that has crossing. And then the rest of this is ribbons that are going around. Oop. And in the end, I'll get a bit of surface with boundary that tightly corresponds to the diagram that I started with. We're done, all right? Now this bit of ribbon surface contains in my drawing of it some extraneous material because I think of this as an abstract surface upon which there is a knot diagram. But in my ribbon, you see a 360 degree twist in the ribbon. I do not care about it. I only care about what structure the surface itself has, but it is a 360 degree twist since this is an orientable surface and it can be removed and flattened without changing the internal topology of the ribbon. So that means that this could have been regarded in the following way. Let me draw it again over here in a planar way. Oops, uh, sorry, that's right. Somebody made an error here, yeah, must have been me.
Okay, now do you see what we've accomplished? This is exactly what I extracted from the surface with a little bit of whoop, with a little bit of untwisting because I don't need the twist. I've made made it so that the normal is always positive, uh, going up out of the plane toward the observer, um, and uh, and there's the basic surface. Uh, on which the knot is sitting. But this can be made into a virtual knot by taking the places where the surface crosses over itself into virtual knots by virtual crossings. So now the story is a little different from the one I told you before about making surfaces. You're going to make a virtual, you're going to take a virtual crossing and you're going to take it into two pieces of ribbon disjoint from one another, which project uh, down into the virtual crossing so that this then projects into the virtual knot diagram hmm, that you see here. So if I started with a virtual knot diagram, I can form a ribbon surface for it by forming neighborhoods like this for the crossings in the diagram and ribbon, uh, ribbon uh, ramps like this corresponding to the virtual crossings in the diagram. And as to which ramp is over and which one is under, that's immaterial because we're really talking about an abstract surface. But for drawing purposes, I choose one or the other. I obtain this surface. And then to obtain a closed surface, we add, so going back in this direction, you add disks to the boundary circles. Now this is a much tighter and closer way to get a knot diagram on a surface from a virtual knot diagram. Because when you form the ribbon neighborhood, that's quite unique in relation to the diagram. And then if you only add disks to the boundary pieces, like in this case, there is one disk here and the rest, that long curve, is also going to have one disk added to it, which is what you see there looking at the torus. You see the rest of that disk being added to the outer edge. So you can get a surface of some genus from the diagram, and in fact, you can figure out how many, what the genus of that surface is. On the other hand, you're going to be allowed to move the diagram by Reitermeister moves on the surface, and you're allowed to move it by Reitermeister moves and detour moves in the plane. And so a given diagram may simplify uh, or complexify into other genus. So when you form the surface uh, of a genus surface with some genus and the diagram in it, that can vary depending on the diagram's uh, actuality. But there is a least genus, and there's a good theorem due to Cooperberg about the topology of the diagrams in the least genus corresponding to the virtual knots. They turn out to be uniquely corresponding. So those are the geometrical points of view that we have, topological geometrical points of view that we have for the virtual knots. They're quite rich, actually. And when one is looking for invariants of the virtual knots, one can look combinatorially at them as diagrams or think of them as knots in these rather simple three-manifolds, thickened surfaces. And of course, another problem that is worth thinking about is the following. Let me state it and then I'll quit. The virtual knot theory um, corresponds to knots in thickened surfaces modulo handle stabilization.
that's the result we've been sketching around today. Um, and over here it has uh, a good diagrammatic formulation. So that's a nice situation, a three-dimensional topology situation about th knots in three manifolds with a good diagrammatic formula formulation. So uh, certainly one should ask, what about other three manifolds? and knots in them. Right? Um, but uh, that that seems a bit more complicated. You can you may you may have some thoughts about it. You could, for example, think of dividing the three manifold by a surface that's called the Hagard surface for the three manifold so that you form two handle bodies on either side of the surface and then think about the knots in relation to that structure and try to get a, um, a, a reasonable diagrammatic theory for knots in the three manifold. And it always comes out a little more complicated than you would like, but uh, nevertheless, it's worth thinking about. So there's a there's a, a bit of talk for an hour and a half about the beginnings of the virtual knot theory, enough to get us started again, I hope, and we'll continue next week. Thank you for listening, and um, maybe there are more questions.